I'm currently a product designer at Dropbox, and I'm going to be walking you through some growth strategies that will help you design more successfully and being more thoughtful when you do growth design. I'm on Twitter, at Airtreo. I just lurk on Twitter, so feel free to follow me. You're not really going to get any content out of that. But if you want to reach out on Twitter, I will answer you. So a little bit about me. I'm currently at Dropbox, but I started my career in mobile gaming at a company called Miniclip. I stayed in mobile gaming, and I moved to San Francisco from Italy, and I worked at a company called Chartboost. At Chartboost, I designed dashboards for advertisers, publishers, uh, ad formats. And I kind of fell in love with growth at Chartboost because everything we designed was very measurable. We had a ton of metrics for advertisers and publishers, and this helped me understand how design can be uh, measured. I then started my own company called Paylance. It was a tool that would allow freelancers to share their work with their customers and their clients and get paid for that work. It was a huge failure, uh, but the learning I got from that was to fail fast and to work within ambiguity, which is a great learning you should have if you're working growth. I then joined a company called Strava. Who's familiar with Strava here? All right, and we have some Strava people here in the front. So Strava is uh, the number one fitness app for runners and cyclists. And at Strava, I worked on the growth team. We mainly focus on activation and acquisition. At Strava, I learned to move really quickly and expedite learning through experimentation. And we'll see some of those learnings today. And then I joined Dropbox, where I currently am right now. On Dropbox, I'm on the growth team, and I focus on acquisition, so top of the funnel. So what we're going to cover today, three things. Number one, what is growth design? If you were here yesterday at Andy's other talk and you'll be here uh, these following nights, you'll probably hear a lot of perspectives on growth, but I want to share mine. Number two, we're going to talk about frameworks to design for growth. I'm going to share some of the things that I've learned. I've failed a lot, but I've learned a lot, so I'm going to be sharing some of those learnings with you, and hopefully you can act on those. And then number three, we're going to see how you can apply that framework through a concrete example, so how it applies to a real project. All right, buckle up. So what is growth design? Well, I think growth design is a way of designing products, obviously, that's characterized by iteration and experimentation. And what that means is it's an empirical way. There's a lot of observation involved. And this allows you to move really quickly and to learn while you're moving quickly. So you might ask, why is growth design important? Well, I can answer that. It allows you to build product rapidly, like we said, and to learn, learn, learn along the way. You're expediting learning. You're moving fast. But it also allows you to manage risk and correct course early. And what that means is you can pivot if need be. If you find the direction you're heading is not the right one, you can pivot course really quickly by moving, um, by moving at this pace and uh, iterating a lot. And most importantly, and lastly, it allows you to tie user value to business goals. And what this means is often growth works in function of moving a business metric. It could be revenue, it could be something else. But it's important that when you show unrealized value to your users, they're going to be more likely to want to obtain that value, which means unlocking business opportunity. So you might be asking, how can one design for growth? I'm going to be walking through some frameworks that will help you understand how you can better design for growth or be a little more thoughtful when doing uh, growth design. So number one, define your North Star. We're going to see how you can have direction when you're designing for growth. We're going to see how you can understand the space, the problems, and this is going to, aim, uh, it's going to help you form some solid hypotheses moving forward. We're then going to see how you can explore in a very lean manner to validate those hypotheses, and then how you can expand and extract more value once you've explored that. And then one more, take your picture now. Build experiments roadmap. How you can be more thoughtful when you're building out a roadmap of experiments. We'll talk about a cautionary tale, and we'll see some best practices there that I, I think are interesting. So number one, defining your North Star. You might be asking, why do I need a North Star? Well, without a North Star, you might feel like this bird. You don't really know where you're headed, what you're doing. Design is less impactful. And what I mean by that is it's harder to tie the, tie the design decisions that you're making uh, to better impact a metric. And as a result, the experimentation isn't going to have a clear direction. Now, on the flip side, if you do have a North Star, the design choices you make are aimed at moving a specific metric or KPI, key performance indicator. And as a result, the experimentation is going to have much more focus. What I want to show you here are some categories of different KPIs, key performance indicators, that will allow you to measure success. What you see on the left is acquisition and revenue. On the right are awareness, activation, and retention. Uh, there's a, a framework invented by Dave McClure of 500 Startups. He calls it the pirate metrics, A-A-A-R-R-R-R. -R -R -R. That's why he calls it the pirate metrics. 
What we see on the left are traditionally more top of the funnel acquisition kind of metrics. Signing up for a product, buying a product or a service, starting a trial, or if you're on a freemium model, upgrading to get the premium version of that. What we see on the right in the blue quadrant are uh, kind of in-app metrics. So install app, that's pretty, pretty obvious. Referring someone else, inviting them to the product. Uploading something. For example, at Strava, we would upload an activity if you went for a run or a ride. Follow rate is a great one also for social networks, following other people. By contact sync rate, you might be uh, syncing your address book and you'll get better recommendations for following other people, so you're building your social graph. So you see how one of, each one of these actually can build up on the other and influence the other. And then the third, the, not the third one, the last one, enabling notifications. This is great for re-engagement. Let's say you haven't opened that app for a week or two. I have this with Headspace. I get a notification every morning and that pulls me back into the app. So enabling notifications is a great one. Now, you might be wondering what I'm showing here. Well, Archimedes, an inventor from 2,000 years ago, would say, give me one firm spot on which to stand and I shall move the earth. How would he move the earth? Well, through a lever. What I want you to take away from this is you and your team can actually find that lever within your product. Oops. Hold on, okay. You can find that lever within your product and as a consequence, you'll, be better, you'll better impact that KPI or that metric. So to amplify the impact, find your KPI's lever. I wanna show an example related to levers of Dropbox's early growth. Who here is familiar with Dropbox? Okay. Um, I joined Dropbox as a user, not as an employee, about 10 years ago, and I joined through an invite. My, I, th I believe at the time my brother invited me and I got some extra space by joining. Has anybody here had that experience with joining Dropbox? Many of you, okay. So you're probably familiar with this type of screen. What we see here, the North Star back in the late 2000s, in the early days, was growing user base. And the way that would be measured is sign up rate top of the funnel metric. Now the lever that was chosen was incentivized referrals. And what this means, it's a two-sided uh, two referral. The person inviting someone else gets some extra space and the person joining gets some extra space. This is pretty common right now. But you, the interesting thing is back then, the core value was space. So you were getting something very valuable by doing this action. The outcome, obviously, the direct outcome is increasing volume of, volume of referrals. But the less direct outcome is increasing new signups of people that are joining. And the interesting thing here is, by increasing new signups, we have more people that are entering into the product and can go impact that lever. So what we've created here is a self-sustained growth engine. And I think it's great if you can find this type of lever to create a self-sustained growth engine within the products where you work and the companies where you work, because it'll keep growing and you'll actually see great results from this. So this leads us to number two. We understood what a North Star is, how to measure it. What I want to do now is talk a little about that ambiguity that you might find at the beginning of a project, and this is very common in growth uh, projects. So understanding space, problems, and forming some solid hypotheses. At the beginning of the project, you often might feel like this. You don't know what lies ahead. You really don't know how to get started and where to go. So you might be asking, well, how can we find that direction? Well, enters the known knowns matrix, also known as the Johari window or the Rumsfeld matrix. We're not gonna go in the details of what those names mean there at the bottom, but I invite you to go Google them because it's an interesting story. At Dropbox, our director of growth design, Angel Steger, recommends using the known knowns matrix at the beginning of a project if you find yourself at an area of strong ambiguity. What you can do here, very often you'll find yourself at the bottom, the bottom two quadrants. Uh, you might be at a larger company where you're sitting on a ton of knowledge that you might not be aware of. So it's an unknown known. It could be past research, it could be experiment results. Or you might be on the far right, on the bottom quadrant, where you don't even have that knowledge. You're starting from scratch. So what she recommends doing is you want to move up and to the left into the red context quadrant. So you want to gather knowledge. The way of gathering knowledge is through talking to neighboring teams, through uh, learning about past experimentation, past research. So it's kind of the investi inv investigation goes on here. Or you might do that through some experiments and you're moving upwards into the experiment quadrant. To make it easier to visualize, I broke it down into a timeline. And what I want to show you is these different steps as they might occur on an actual timeline. So in the first step, you're going to be understanding the space you're in, in the outcome here is to gather some knowledge, context. 
you're going to have to define what you want to learn. So we talked about North Stars, KPIs. You want to use all that and understand the problems to form some strong hypotheses. And Derek covered a little bit on how you can write a good hypothesis. Now in the third stage, you want to define how you might learn that. And what this means is actual design of the experiments. What are you going to design? How will they build up on each other? How do they live in, a, in a, an experiment roadmap? And in the fourth and last, you're going to launch those experiments. What that means is obtaining those learnings. Did you get the picture? OK. All right. OK. So in the third step of our framework, we're going to talk about exploration, validation, and expansion. I think this is the most characteristic for growth. It's the one I enjoy the most. So exploration, validation, and expansion. You might be wondering, who's, who's this gentleman? This is a pretty old picture. So this picture was taken around 1915. This is my great-grandfather. He was in the oil drilling business. And you can see him here pictured in a, in a field in front of an oil rig. And I know you might be asking, it's 2019. We're talking about digital product design. We're in San Francisco. Why is he showing us a picture of 100 years ago? Well, my grandfather did this. He started out very poor, and he acquired some land. He started digging in that land with the tools he had. He had no money, and he found oil. So what he did is he was able to raise some money, build some rigs, and extract that oil. And he continued doing this, and he bought more land and more land. And eventually, by the early 1920s, he was a millionaire. He lost it all, so I don't have any of that right now. He lost it in 1929. But the learning that I have here and the analogy with what I do today and what I think you could do in growth is you're exploring. You have the pickaxe and the shovel, the same thing he was doing when he was poor in the beginning. And you're going to be running cost-effective experiments to validate or invalidate those hypotheses and to find that business opportunity in this phase. But once you have found that opportunity, similar to what he did with his first oil field, when he raised some money to buy those oil rigs and build them, you expand. And what that means, now you're going to be extracting that value. You've identified the value in a cost-effective way at speed, and now you can start expanding that. And I realize these are pretty abstract ways of describing it, and you might be wondering, well, how does this apply to product design? How does this apply to my day-to-day -day job? So I want to show some quick examples of that. In the explore phase, you might want to speak to users first. We talked about moving at speed, cost-effective, spend, spend little time, little money. Um, speak to users first. You can do this through usability studies, using paper prototypes, envision prototypes, what have you. But the goal here is to speak to your users, which Derek also touched on. You want to experiment on highly trafficked surfaces and flows. What this means is you want to be able to reach statistical significance with your experiments sooner rather than later. So you'll choose areas of the product where there's high traffic of users, very likely. Single platform. Uh, often due to engineering resources, you might find yourself, uh, we, don't, we only have an iOS engineer available for the sprint or a web engineer. Choose one platform and explore in that one platform. There will be time to reach parity in the next phase. Utilizing existing components as product designers, we might want to come up with these new patterns, these new components that are amazing and, and very helpful in this experiment. But I would say if you can't directly correlate having that component to the outcome of the experiment, then hold off. Try using what you have in this stage if necessary. And holding off on localization. So depending on the size of the company, localization could take one, two, three weeks. Maybe you're using external vendors. So try testing in one geo. Similarly to bullet point uh, number two, try testing in high surface uh, areas of the, uh, high traffic areas of the product and in geos where your audience is larger. So you're going to be able to move at speed. And very often that's in English. Copy is the interface. My former manager at Strava would always say, copy is the interface. And I think he's right. The words you use in this stage could make or break an experiment. So you want to make sure and be extra sure you're using copy that, or language that is extremely clear, regardless of the language. Uh, I've done usability tests on copy in the past. It's quite fun. You can find some interesting insights. So focus a lot on the language you're using, even in these early stages. So now let's imagine we've validated, we found opportunity in the explore phase. We're ready to move on to the expansion phase and extract that value. So this is a moment to go in, improve and personalize the user experience. Perhaps there's customer segmentation you want to design for. Design those edge cases. I think you should always think about edge cases, but in an exploratory phase, you might want to withhold on the very small edge cases, because it's very likely that a small or insignificant portion of users will go through that. 
Designed for platform parity, if you ran your exploration tests on iOS only, now is the moment to expand that learning, expand that experience into Android, into web, and reach that parity. The risk of that is otherwise you'll have features on one platform and not on the other, and that's not ideal. Design custom components. Let's say you leverage existing components and made them work for your experiment. This is the moment to get crazy and design those custom components that you held off on. Localize. Now is the moment to do that. In polish, what I mean by polish is invest a little more in micro interactions, custom illustrations, iconography. Picture moment. Okay. That takes us to our fourth and last phase of the framework. So in this phase, I want to talk about building an experiments roadmap. Build an experiments roadmap. We were talking about geology, digging for oil, so I want to keep using that analogy of rocks. You might find yourself, if you, if you spend too much time in the explore phase, you might find yourself with something like this. This is your product. It's full of small standalone experiments that I refer to as pubbles. Uh, they're usually easier to build, um, and thus they're smaller. See, the problem with pebbles is it's going to be harder to stack them one on the other, and all the movement you're going to have is from 0 to 0.1 to 0.2, 0.3, 0.4. And it's a problem. You're never going to be able to reach that North Star, build a nice tower up to the North Star. So this is a cautionary tale, something that I've experienced in, in some past projects I worked on. I've made this up. I've totally made it up. It's called the quality learning ratio. Often you get out of it what you put into it. And it's similar to something Derek also covered. So let's imagine uh, this is our product team at a ride-sharing company. And they're having a brainstorm, a meeting. Someone says, our research shows riders want an alternate mode of transportation to avoid traffic. Idea. What if we gauge their interests with a light, cost-effective test inside the product? Yeah. That'll learn so, that will allow us to learn really fast and cheap before we invest more. It makes a lot of sense, right? It's the exploratory phase. So the team goes out, designs, builds, and ships the experiment. It's something like this. Um, I'm in a ride-sharing app. I'm, calling my, I'm selecting my vehicle to get from point A to B, and there's a pop-up. Avoid traffic with a jetpack. Wow, that's new. It avoids traffic. That's really what people wanted, our research showed. So I'm a user, and I click on that. And now I see a modal that says, jetpacks are coming soon near you. Bummer. It's not really actionable. I can't do anything. So the test runs for a few weeks, statistical significance is reached, and the results come back. The team gather, gathers around the table again. Hey, results showed high engagement, 99.9% .9 click-through rate on that test. That's incredibly high. Someone has an idea. Bingo. Jetpacks are what our users want and what our users will need. They showed us through this test. They engage with that uh, cell. Let's invest into this product. This is the right moment to invest. We were in the exploratory phase. We can move on. Well, wrong. I think that's wrong, and I'll tell you why. I think the experiment quality was too low. And what I mean by too low, it's not a matter of effort, but the learning that we can extract from that experiment, unfortunately, is blurred. So it's not actionable. Click through a pop-up is not a sufficient signal to invest such amount of effort to build a fleet of jetpacks in this case. So we might have something like this. This is a small test that I showed the pop-up. It's a little pebble. And now we're going to build a boulder on top of it. That's not the right foundation you want to build a large test and invest possibly months or years of your roadmap on. So you might be asking, so how can we be more thoughtful when we're designing for growth? Well, what I say here is boulders and pebbles, not boulders on pebbles. Boulders and pebbles, as you can see on the right, we're stacking one and the other, but there's a rhythm there. We're mixing small, lightweight, fast experiments with bigger ones. And what, what this allows us to do is build the knowledge we get from one on the other to inform the next one. And that'll allow us to build high up something that's more solid and can take us up to that North Star. So I want to show a little examples of, I think, uh, from personal experience, if you focus too much on pebbles, what might happen? Your team isn't going to be very happy. Engineers, designers, product managers probably aren't going to be too excited. Team morale is going to go down because they're not inspiring kind of projects. You will see results in the short term, but they're certainly going to wane off. The novelty will show uh, good results initially, though. And it's really hard to shift user behavior by doing 0 to 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. It's extremely hard.
Now, if you focus only on boulders, something else might happen. It takes really long to get those learnings. And we talked about growth being a way of moving very fast and expediting learning. And this is kind of the opposite of that. Learnings are going to be really delayed, and the results are also going to be delayed. It's going to take longer to design. It's going to take longer to build. But mostly, if it takes you very long to design and build, the market might actually shift under your feet while you're doing it, and you won't even realize it. And you can't pivot quickly as a result. So if you mix boulders and pebbles, you'll have a healthy mix like you see here. So this is our last section, applying the framework. And I want to walk you through some of the exa an exa actually an exact an concrete example of something I worked on at Strava at my previous company. So we're going to walk through all steps of the framework, and we're going to see how they apply to this project. And the project is activity tagging. And actually, the designer I built it with is sitting here in the front. Hi, Stefan. So activity tagging was uh, an initial experiment we started on the growth team at Strava for acquisition. And it allowed someone that went out and ran or rode with someone to add them if that person wasn't on Strava. And you'll see a little more detail about that. So our North Star, talking about North Star, was growing user base. It was an acquisition project. Our KPIs, signups, as you would expect. So new members joining Strava. And the lever we chose to act on and to use to impact that were real life interactions that were linked to Strava. And what that, what that means is perhaps I'm a Strava athlete and I go on a run with some friends and those friends are not on Strava. So now we're leveraging that connection that exists on Strava but that also can exists in the real life world. So understanding the space, some of the context, we knew that athletes are very likely to work out with other people. And it's very likely those other people aren't on Strava. And we know that word of mouth drives a lot of traffic and a lot of people join through word of mouth. So it's very strong for that product. Now the problem was that athletes couldn't add friends that didn't record to their activities on Strava. We confirmed this with speaking to a multitude of athletes, reaching out through customer support. So we had qualitative ways to confirm this. So we then formed an hypothesis. And this hypothesis was that athletes actually want to add friends that didn't record to their Strava activities. And the second hypothesis we had here was that people that are not on Strava, so non-users, are going to be more likely to join Strava when they actually get added to an activity that they did with a friend. So how did we go about exploring it? Well, we started with a simple cell test on the activity detail view on mobile. We chose Android for resource reasons. We're in an exploration phase, so we chose one platform. And what we did is we added a little cell inviting you to, or prompting you to invite someone you had possibly worked out with. And the reason we did that was to understand, is there actually opportunity here? We know from qualitative research that people work out with folks that aren't on Strava. We want to confirm that in the product, but we also understand uh, if there's interest to act on that. And as a result, we also want to see if people are willing to join after they receive this invite. And the KPIs here were volume of invites sent, but that ladders up to the North Star, which was signups. So ultimately, we're tracking the volume of invites going out, but the signups that derive from that. The learnings we found, substantial learnings, um, large volume of invites going out, and a consistent amount of people joining through this experience. So we found out that athletes actually do work out with people in real life that aren't on Strava. We found out that people are willing to add them, have that desire. And lastly, we found out that being added to Strava represents sufficient value for one to join to obtain that activity. So then we moved into the expansion phase. This was the exploration phase. Expansion, what did we do? We improved the experience. We allowed you to actually add someone instead of inviting them, sending out an invite. We built out a system for adding people that are already on Strava. So this is great for re-engagement. They would get notified, they'd come back in, next time they might record themselves. Then we worked on platform parity. We built it out on web, which we had held back on, and we built it out on iOS. And then we improved the experience for non-users. Instead of going to the App Store, they could see a, um, a view of that activity as a logged out user before actually deciding to convert and install the app. So this is what we did with activity tagging. This is how we applied that framework. And it's interesting to see that this was a very simple invite cell experiment on activity detail. And it actually became a good way of Remember that uh, self-sustained growth engine of people having real-life interactions with others that aren't on Strava and leveraging the product to bring them in for us. 
So that's all I have. But before I leave you, I want to share a quote of Drew Houston. He's our CEO and co-founder of Dropbox. And I think it plays really well with what we've talked about tonight. And he says, not launching, painful, but not learning, fatal. Thank you.